Is a microwave a computer? Yes. It also makes popcorn. So wait a second then, what do we mean by a computer anyway? I can't use my microwave to browse websites, so what do my smartphone and my microwave have in common? Basically, your smartphone and your microwave both have hardware that can be programmed and process data. Although your smartphone is much more powerful, at a high enough level, your smartphone and your microwave are both computers. In this episode, we're going to explore what every software engineer should know about hardware and how their computer works. When we say what every software engineer should know, it's because 99% of the time, we don't actually need to know a whole lot about how the computer hardware works. We have all these wonderful abstractions that hide that detail from us. That's progress that lets us get our job done without getting bogged down in the details. However, when things go wrong, it's frequently really helpful to know a little bit more. For example, if your computer program runs out of memory, you probably need to know at least how much memory your computer has in it. So let's talk about how this actually works. For the purposes of this video, we're going to say computers are made up of three main parts. The first is the central processing unit, or CPU, that actually runs programs. The second is memory, which stores data and the programs themselves. The third is called input-output, or I.O., and this is how your computer interacts with the real world. Let's break that down. <laughs> Let's start with memory. As we've already mentioned, memory is the thing that stores our data. For smartphones, that could be phone numbers or cat pictures, and for the microwave, it could be the number of seconds remaining or the current time. It's the component that stores our important bits. So how does memory actually work? Memory is physical space in your computer broken down into slots. In each of these slots, there's something like a switch that's either on or it's off. If it's on, we put a one value. If it's off, we put a zero. We continue to do this for every slot available in memory. Everything stored in memory in your phone, your microwave, and even your computer are represented by the, just these zero and one values. The number system comprised of just zeros and ones is called binary because it's two-based, as opposed to the human-friendly decimal number system, which is 10-based. Computers use binary because it's easy to interpret whether or not a switch is on or off. If computers used a number system like decimal, for example, they would have to map individual voltages to the different digits. That would be harder to read. So getting back to our slots, Individual zeros and ones are called bits, which is just an abbreviation for binary digits. Once we have enough bits in memory, we can represent things like integers, strings, pictures, videos, and more. Okay, now that we know how memory actually works, how do we actually use it? We are effectively given one big contiguous chunk of bits. Nearly all systems today are what is called byte addressable, which means the smallest piece of that that we can access is one byte, which is eight bits. Each byte is given a number, which is its address, representing its sequence in memory. So for example, byte 100 is followed by byte 101, which is followed by byte 102. <laughs> if this is sounding a little bit like an array, that's because it is. An array is really just an abstraction on top of a big chunk of contiguous memory that you can then access by index. To read a byte from memory, the CPU gives memory its address, and the memory hands back the data that's stored at that address. To do a write, the CPU gives memory both the address and the data, and it then stores them. On modern hardware, these reads and writes are actually done in bigger chunks, but we don't really need to talk about that here. So, just because we've stored data in memory doesn't mean we understand what it represents. This value, for instance, could be the letter A, the number 65, or an instruction for the central processing unit. We actually need the central processing unit in order to interpret the values that we've stored in memory. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. Its job is to execute our programs, which will then read and modify the data that's in memory. Well, but what data are we actually going to work with? Well, it works with data in two locations, data that's on the CPU and data that's in memory. The data that's on the CPU itself is stored in things called registers. Each CPU has a fixed number of registers, each of which contains a fixed number of bits. For example, on an Intel x86-64 CPU, there are 16 general purpose registers, each of which stores 64 bits, or 8 bytes of data. Data in registers can be read and modified by instructions. Instructions are single steps in your program that the CPU will then execute. So for example, to add two numbers, you will use an instruction that can take the value in R8 and add it into the value of R9. To write really meaningful programs, we actually need to access lots of data, and there simply isn't enough space on the CPU itself to do anything interesting. That's where memory comes in. In order for our CPU to communicate with memory, it uses a component called a bus. Buses allow us to transfer data between different components in the same computer or between different computers altogether. 
Buses themselves are made up essentially of just three different sets of wires. The first set is a set with the address and memory it wants to access. The second set of wires contains any relevant data for the transaction. The third set of wires are called the control wires. So let's say our CPU wants to read from memory. The CPU would then execute a load instruction. It would set the address wire to the particular address in memory it wants to access, and then it would set the value on the control wires to read. Memory would then see that signal, access that particular location in memory, and put back whatever is stored there on the data wires. Writes would work the same way, but the CPU would also pass some set of data on the data wires for the memory to then store. Now that we have more data, we can write more complex and interesting programs. A program is really just a sequence of instructions that are executed one after each other. For example, in our microwave, our clock display has both minutes and seconds. If we want to compute the total number of seconds left to cook our popcorn, we need to take the minutes, multiply it by 60, so that's one instruction, and then take the seconds and add it to the total, and that's the second instruction. To be really general purpose though, we need a special instruction called a conditional branch. This is an instruction that can test if a certain condition is true, and if it is, start executing the program somewhere else. For example, if we want to now count down until the total seconds remaining is zero, we can subtract one from the total, test to see if that total is equal to zero, and if it is not equal to zero, jump back and subtract one again. This is a loop. It's the conditional branch that lets us execute all the wonderful control structures that we want to use in our programming languages, like if statements, loops, and functions. It's also the thing that makes our computers turn complete, but that's a theory thing that I don't really fully understand. Amazing. We can store data, we can run programs, we can be fickle and conditional, we're unstoppable. I think we forgot something. If you actually want popcorn, we need some way for our CPU to be able to do things in the real world. This is where input-output devices, or I.O. devices, come in. An I.O. device is a piece of hardware that interfaces between our computer and the real world, allowing us to get data into the computer and allowing the computer to actually do things. For example, in the microwave, we really need the CPU to be able to turn the microwave on to start cooking and then turn off when it's done. This is called memory mapped I.O. because the input-output device is mapped to a place in memory. There are other I.O. modes, but for the purposes of this video, we can assume everything works the same way. To receive data from a device, our program just needs to read from that device's magic memory location. To send data to a device, it writes to it. So how does this actually work? To receive data, the CPU executes a load instruction from the device's magic memory address. The device is also attached to the same bus's memory. When it sees the magic address on the address wires, it puts its data on the shared data wires. The CPU is then able to retrieve the data from the input-output device, just like it would receive any data from memory. So now we're able to connect a ton of input-output devices to our CPU and our memory. In thinking about the microwave, we can connect an on-off button, a keypad to enter a number of seconds, and heat settings. In thinking about our smartphones or computers, we have things like touchscreens, keyboards, and mice. In each of these cases, we are connecting input-output devices to make our computers more responsive and more powerful. So is a microwave a computer? Yes, it has a CPU to tell it what to do, memory to store data, and a few primitive I.O. devices to talk to the real world. So while your smartphone and laptop may be many times more powerful, they fundamentally work the same way. But they don't make popcorn. <laughs> nope. I think that's good. <laughs>